Chapters fifty and fifty one of Out of the Shadow by Rose Gollop Cohen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter fifty. The first person with whom I made friends, or rather who tried to be friends with me, was the assistant house doctor. He was not at all good looking, but he was big and strong and good natured. His small gray eyes twinkled merrily under his light bushy eyebrows. The first time he spoke to me was when he came to take a drop of blood from my finger we want to see he said whether you have blood or water in your veins and he laughed how do you feel fine i said he gave my hand a slap and watched to see if it would get pink you will have to feel a great deal finer before you can leave here he said he tightened his lips and nodded at me as much as to say you might as well make up your mind to it i was not at all grieved to hear this indeed i should have been grieved if it were to be otherwise for i already loved it here the second time he came i had a book which my mother had brought me to read he sat down on the edge of the bed took up the book and looked at the first page then he turned to the end and he looked in the middle his face became more and more perplexed i cannot read a word of it he finally said what do you call this it is yiddish i told him read a little i read why he exclaimed it sounds like german i tried to explain to him that yiddish had many german words though they were pronounced somewhat differently i tried to explain it in english and i had to guess at many words and so to make sure that it was clear i also explained it in german for like every jewish person i made some claim to being able to speak german what else can you speak the doctor was looking quite merry again russian i said in the peasant dialect of the village from which i come he looked about the ward and asked the russian word for table chair plant window bed i told him and he tried to say each word after me he had his mouth all screwed up and he pronounced the words almost like an infant i could not help laughing and he laughed too his hearty laugh sounded through the whole ward and many of the patients took it up and laughed with us not knowing what it was all about what a merry people are the americans i thought we took things more seriously but very often he was serious too he would sit on the edge of the bed with his arms folded and ask me to tell him about home and the shop one day i saw him coming into the ward accompanied by a beautiful woman she wore a bunch of violets tied with a purple cord as they came along there was a sound like the rustling of leaves and the air about my bed became sweet ruth the doctor said i want to introduce you to a friend i had never dreamed there was anything like her beauty her blue-black hair her blue-gray eyes her teeth her smile but though i was so ignorant of life i understood at once somehow that much of this woman's beauty was due to the care she had received all her life and her mother before her and perhaps even her grandmother it was so clear that every root of her hair almost received special attention she came to see me often and brought me roses once she brought a big box full of pink ones with thick green rough-looking stems she laid a full-blown flower on my lap and went to give the rest to the other patients as she left my bed i wiped hot tears away i had wanted a bud because it would last longer but the next moment i thought of myself with contempt that it should mean so much to me most of the time she came accompanied only by the doctor once she brought a friend a charming young girl of twenty-one who told me she had just come home from college she plied me with eager questions about home and the shop even if i had known how to express myself what could i tell them i felt ashamed before these women that seemed to know nothing that was ugly or evil very soon i had still another friend at four o'clock in the afternoon a professor used to come in he was tall slender and bald his small face was round and pink and so jolly that i would feel myself begin to grin the moment i caught sight of him or heard his voice one afternoon he said i am going to bring a friend to see you she is very unhappy will you try and cheer her up i said yes without knowing what i was saying with all the doctors and nurses looking on and listening for they were making their rounds the next afternoon he came in with a young woman dressed in deep mourning he introduced her and went away to join the troop of doctors waiting for him at the first bed she was as charming as my doctor's friend though not quite so handsome but what i chiefly noticed and felt was her deep sorrow 
though she made an effort to appear cheerful i could see that she was weighed down by grief it was in her eyes in the expression of her face in her every motion she told me that her mother had died recently and then she sat quite still looking about the ward but i knew that she did not see the things at which she was looking after a while she asked would you like me to read to you i thought that perhaps in this way she would forget for a while so i said quickly yes the next time she came she had a book with her all i remember of it is the name under the red robe i was not in the main ward now but in the annex where there were only ten beds occupied by patients that were the least sick and had to remain long beside my bed there was a fine window facing park avenue and at this window my friend sat down and read her voice was agreeable and she read steadily i was thinking as i watched her face that she seemed very much interested when suddenly the book slipped from her hands she laid her head on my pillow and wept i looked at her a moment then moved my face close to hers and wept too one day after she had gone the patients whispered to each other and the nearest to me asked do you know who that woman is of course i did not she is a daughter of one of the biggest millionaires in the united states you are very fortunate to have such a friend then she said but it is wasted on you she was a grey-haired woman with a toothless mouth and she mumbled to herself about throwing pearls to the swine but i thought what strange things happen in america the daughter of a millionaire and i crying on one pillow then i wondered why i was receiving so much attention i did not know that the part of the city where i was living was called the east side or the slums or the ghetto and that the face of the east side or the slums or the ghetto was still new and a curiosity to the people in this part of the city a sight to cheer any unhappy person but the daily life in the ward i found quite as interesting as my new friends having a fondness for looking and dreaming and i am afraid to say for idleness the life in bed exactly suited me i heard many of the patients complain about the food and the attendance and that they could not sleep that life was dull and they longed to be out but not i i found every one kind and not a moment was dull or monotonous there was so much to see and every minute something new seemed to happen to begin with the early morning at five o'clock when our little night nurse brought us each a basin of water and woke us up to wash i would see that her face looked paler than it had been in the evening her cap a little askew her apron not quite as fresh and her smile not so bright but she hurried hurried to make up as many beds as possible before the day nurses were to come she was so sweet so sweet this little nurse there was such a warm touch in her small roughened hands at seven o'clock the day nurses came in looking fresh and rested i would watch each one going to her task with something of a soldier's regularity if the breakfast happened to be up they came in at once carrying the trays of food then our ward so quiet a minute before was filled with life the door swung back and forth there was a clatter of dishes a smell of coffee and the dull pat-pat of the nurse's rubber-soled shoes on the floor as they came tripping in each carrying two trays the upper resting on two cups the good motherly nurses brought their trays in looking neat and the food was hot and tempting while the careless or indifferent ones came straggling in late and the food was cold and spilled over after breakfast there was a hustle and bustle of tidying up and a sweeper came in she was a big stout woman with dark angry eyes and a bang of oily iron-gray hair that curled all about her forehead when she took a dislike to a patient she would bang the broom handle against the bed as she swept under it i used to lie waiting and quivering at the thought of her coming by nine o'clock not a safety pin was out of place the patients lay back fresh and clean and the doctors came in to make their rounds i would prop myself up against my pillows smooth my bedclothes and watch them going from bed to bed the nurses lined up on one side the doctors on the other they looked so different from us the people i had been accustomed to see all my life they were tall healthy men and women so well dressed with such fine quiet manners and i wondered how they lived outside of the hospital what their homes were like these two were americans all gentile english-speaking people were americans to me these looked so different from our americans on cherry street did they too hate the jews since i had been here i had not once been made to feel that there was any difference 
and i as i was growing to know and understand and love the people all about me was losing my intense nationalism on monday afternoons a missionary used to come into our ward she was dressed in black and i always thought of her as being long and narrow even her features were long and narrow she would give out the hymn books and then stand in the doorway between the annex and the main ward and lead the singing she had a loud shrill voice that could be heard above the voices of the patients after the singing as she collected her hymn books she talked to each of us she would ask how do you feel but she never stopped to hear the answer in the same breath she would begin to talk about christ the first time she bent her tall back form over my bed i felt very uncomfortable and when she began to talk about christ i was miserable finally i said i am a jewess and now i thought she would go away at once but to my surprise she walked around to the other side of my bed and only now began to talk to me earnestly my face began to burn i saw that she wanted to convert me and i on the other hand thought it a sin even to listen to her finally i contrived to put my fingers into my ears and make it appear that i merely had my hands over them and now i lay still and looked at her her lips moved rapidly and gradually a red spot appeared on each cheek and a tiny white bead of foam worked itself into each corner of her mouth after a few times i felt that she could never convert me and i no longer put my fingers into my ears when mother came again i told her about everything else but i did not mention the missionary i thought i am perfectly safe and they will only worry at home but danger came from where i least expected it besides the missionary another religious person used to come into our ward first he would come in the afternoon to distribute pamphlets he was a quiet elderly distinguished-looking man with longish silver-white hair he nodded to each patient as he laid the pamphlet on the bed with an easy reach and only stopped to talk to the elderly women i noticed that he did not talk about religion at all he asked them how they were he was not smiling but his pale quiet face looked kind and sympathetic one day as he laid the magazine on my bed he stopped and glanced at my card are you a jewess he asked in his quiet way looking from the card to my face i said yes he smiled it is a good religion he said earnestly and went on to the next bed when had i ever heard any one praise our religion the words had a strange effect on me i sat up and watched him as long as he was in the ward i thought to this man i would like to talk at the end of the day when the sun was going down and we were finishing our supper he would come again to say prayers as he came in with his long even stride his person invited peace and quiet if a nurse were in the ward she would sit down for a moment and we patients handled the dishes less noisily he would stop in the great doorway between the annex and the ward and turn the pages of his bible slowly very slowly that we might have a chance to finish little by little it grew quiet the last sounds came more and more softly the shifting of trays the tinkle of a spoon on a glass a sigh then came his earnest mellow tone low yet filling every corner of the wards our father who art in heaven after he was gone i would lie quite still still hearing his voice his words were on my lips one day i sat up and took the bible from the box on the bedstead and looked at it without opening it this was the first time i had touched it and i felt guilty and uneasy then i thought how could it be a sin to know this man's religion and i opened it there had always been a mystery about this bible as well as about the people who read it the mystery about the people was almost dissolved and now about the book too i could see nothing mysterious it had a musty smell like any other book that was old and little used here and there the pages stuck together with a bit of food i put it back into the box the next day i took it out again opened the first page and picked out the words that i knew those that i could not read i spelled over to the next patient and she told me how to pronounce the words and the meaning i read every day and soon i was able to read by myself and as i began to understand it i became more and more interested finally i thought about it constantly i wanted to understand the christian religion i was so eager to know and understand it that though i felt so timid and sensitive i began to talk about it ask questions 
asked for explanations and soon i gave the impression that i wanted to become a christian one day my doctor's friend asked ruth do you really want to become a christian i looked at her oh no i said she laughed merrily i thought not no i did not want to become a christian and yet i felt dreadfully troubled in the meantime daily life in the ward became even more interesting after weeks and weeks in bed i was at last allowed up and when i again learned to walk i enjoyed helping the nurses i learned how to make beds beautifully i used to bring the patients water i combed their hair i rubbed their bedridden backs with alcohol i often remained for hours at a fever patient's bed and applied ice compresses i was happy to learn all these things i determined that if any one should be sick after i returned home i would attend to them just as i saw the patients here attended so three months passed it was a bright day in june when i bade farewell to all my friends in the presbyterian hospital when i came out of the building i looked up at the windows i thought of the life to which i was going and a feeling of dread came over me then i remembered that it was three months since i had seen the children and i turned and walked quickly to the third avenue car chapter fifty one although almost five years had passed since i had started for america it was only now that i caught a glimpse of it for though i was in america i had lived in practically the same environment which we brought from home of course there was a difference in our joys in our sorrows in our hardships for after all this was a different country but on the whole we were still in our village in russia a child that came to this country and began to go to school had taken the first step into the new world but the child that was put into the shop remained in the old environment with the old people held back by the old traditions held back by illiteracy often it was years before he could stir away from it sometimes it would take a lifetime sometimes too it happened as in fairy tales that a hand was held out to you and you were helped out in my own case it was through the illness which had seemed such a misfortune that i had stirred out of cherry street but now that i had had a glimpse of the new world a revolution took place in my whole being i was filled with a desire to get away from the whole old order of things and i went groping about blindly stumbling suffering and making others suffer and then through the experience intelligence and understanding of other beings a little light came to me and i was able to see that the old world was not all dull and the new not all glittering and then i was able to stand between the two with a hand in each the first thing that i can recall after i came from the hospital is a feeling of despondency the rooms seemed smaller and dingier than they had been in the evening the lamp burned more dimly and there was a general look of hopelessness over everything it was in every face it was in every corner of our dull home as well as in all the other homes that i saw it was in every sound that came in from the street in every sigh that i heard in the house i saw the years stretching ahead of me always the same and i wept bitterly i had never been so aware of it all in the shop where i found work now it was as at home as i looked at the men i could not help comparing them with those other men to the little insinuating jokes and stories i listen now not with resignation as before but with anger why should this be why should they talk like that and i was filled with a blinding dislike for the whole class of tailors but i did not give my entire thought to what i saw about me as the days passed i became aware that i was waiting for something for what i could scarcely say away in the back of my head there was this thought surely this would not end here would this be all i would see of that other world outside of cherry street and i waited from day to day in the meantime i filled up the days at work with dreaming of that other life i had seen i thought a good deal about that fine old man the minister his words and his voice had remained fresh in my mind of course i must not breathe a word at home about him about the new testament this necessity for secrecy soon led to other little secret thoughts and actions it soon occurred to me why should i not read the new testament if i want to why should i not do anything i like if four months ago father thought me old enough to get married then i am certainly old enough now to decide things for myself 
so i stopped consulting mother and began to do little things independently it was not hard to do this for during the three months i had grown away from home a good deal and now with the thought of my experience in which they had no part every day i was slipping away little by little mother noticed and her eyes looked troubled but i did not understand their meaning father had tightened the reins of authority and i only tried the harder to writhe myself free my only thought now was of myself and the world outside of home and cherry street but underneath all this perversity and selfishness i can see now as i look back a deep longing to see to know to understand in the settlement i was not so often now miss wald saw that i came home looking well and at once found work so she thought she would leave well enough alone besides i had told her about my friends in the hospital so perhaps she thought that she would stand aside and give the others a chance the settlement was of course included in my mind in that outside world of which i dreamed but i felt too timid to go there often even on invitation without a reason some one of the reasons for which the settlement seemed to be established one day however when i was thinking of the new testament it occurred to me to go to the nurses and ask for it where would i get it if not from them they were gentiles and they would surely have it and i started at once with that new something in me that was defiant of all the old life i found miss brewster in the little basement and asked her for it timidly and with great uncertainty for it was hard for a jewish girl brought up as i had been even to utter the words i want to read the new testament the thought of becoming a christian was nowhere in my mind but this would be the first real step beyond the boundary miss brewster looked at me silently and as if she did not quite understand and i felt still more uneasy under her observation and explained eagerly i want so to read it she finally said i am afraid ruth dear we cannot give it to you you see your father would think true the nurses have been kind to my daughter but they have led her away from our faith and that would never do for the settlement do you see i was beginning to feel a little guilty what she said the way she said it and looked at me made me feel that i was wrong to act in secrecy again she observed me for a long moment then she put her arm around me and said pleasantly come we walked up the little staircase to the sitting-rooms on the first floor she put me into a deep chair and then she knelt before the bookcase she hummed cheerfully as she looked from shelf to shelf and i sat and watched her her every motion to me was new and interesting and charming she represented the people i wanted to know the new life i desired she finally held out to me a tiny volume and said with a smile and in that rich voice of hers here ruth is a sweet love story read it and i took it away with me the name of it i do not remember and though it was not the bible for the time being it satisfied me indeed just at present it did more than that it filled me with joy for strange and stupid as it may seem it had not occurred to me that now i could read anything i felt so proud that i could read an english book that i carried it about with me in the street i took it along to the shop i became quite vain often as i looked about me while walking through the street it seemed to me that now i did not belong here i did not feel a part of it all as i did formerly but very soon something happened which showed me that indeed it was here that i belonged one day a letter came from my doctor's friend this was the thing for which i had been waiting and this too was the first letter i had ever received but i could not read it the children could not read it either except a word here and there they pored over the crisp blue paper while i stood over them anxiously and then they handed it back to me it is written in a fancy handwriting they said and then like any poor illiterate old woman i had to run to a drug store and ask a clerk to read my letter to me i felt ashamed before the clerk at not being able to read i determined to try and learn a little from the children and again go to night school when winter came End of chapter fifty one Chapters fifty two through fifty six of Out of the Shadow by Rose Gollop Cohen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter fifty two. My education, if it can be so called, began in the following manner and continued in the same painful, unsystematic way all through the years. Self consciousness and timidity were a hindrance, and I was always ashamed of showing my ignorance. 
but we were all ashamed of showing our ignorance a girl who could not read and write would do anything to hide it we were as much ashamed of it as we were of our poverty indeed to show one was to show the other they seemed inseparable my education then began in this wise an informal talk was to be given on shakespeare at the nurse's settlement and miss wald or miss brewster i do not remember which urged me to come and i promised the lecture was in the sitting-room in the east broadway house from the doorway i saw about half a dozen women of the type that we looked upon as teachers sitting in easy chairs and discoursing in low tones and at a little table on which there was a shaded lamp one woman sat with some papers before her as i took in the atmosphere so foreign to me and the type of people i was at once sorry that i had come and i glanced into the corners for an inconspicuous seat when an overkind lady came over and fairly forced me into a chair at the little table right opposite the lecturer and put a volume in my hands i felt the light full upon me it was on my hands it shone on my lap it seemed to shine right into me showing my ignorance the evening passed in perfect misery and i heard little more than a buzzing of voices with every now and then such words as shakespeare plays new edition old edition a later edition and then you can get it in the library i breathed with relief only when i came out into the street but by then i was glad that i had gone and glad that i had remained and now as usual after it was all over the things i had seen and heard came back to me distinctly and i reflected over them shakespeare this was an old friend i remembered the men in mr cohen's shop discussing shakespeare's plays evidently shakespeare wrote that book that had been in my lap i felt proud of this new knowledge and i walked home with a feeling of superiority over myself of the day before i do not know how but it was now that i found that there were such things as free libraries and i joined the one at the educational alliance i felt greatly awed when i looked around from my place in the line to the librarian's desk and saw the shelves and shelves of books and the stream of people hastening in and out with books under their arms nevertheless i held my head high couldn't i read now and if i could read the whole world of knowledge was open to me so i imagined when my turn came at the desk i said to the librarian please give me the best thing that shakespeare wrote she looked at me questioningly do you want his plays i reflected the word play suddenly suggested to me entertainment and i wanted something serious is that the best i asked she shrugged and smiled a little she was a pretty jewish american girl i don't know which is his best she said it surprised me to hear her acknowledge her ignorance so frankly she asked again do you want his life i thought the story of a person's life must be interesting but no doubt it was hard to understand perhaps i had better begin with a play a play i said which any she brought me a volume and when i was out in the hall and alone i stopped and read the name slowly julius caesar i pored and pored over my book for two weeks i put it away and went to it again and tried to understand it but all i could get out of it were words here and there i could not get any meaning out of any of it i felt heart-sore and humiliated i think it was then that i fully realized how little i knew how ignorant i was i decided to be guided by the librarian her frank acknowledgment that she did not know which of shakespeare's plays was the best made a deep impression on me and i decided that i too would be frank with her the next time i stood before her desk i said to her i can read just a little and i do not understand much will you give me a book any book like for a child she brought me little women chapter fifty three father did not take kindly to my reading how could he he saw that i took less and less interest in the home that i was more dreamy that i kept more to myself evidently reading and running about and listening to speeches as he called it was not doing me any good but what father feared most was that now i was mingling so much with gentiles and reading gentile books i would wander away from the jewish faith this fear caused great trouble and a misunderstanding between us of that period this is the first outbreak i recall one day my brother the one who had once dreamed of becoming a great rabbi and who was still very religious on looking through my library book found the word christ 
at once he took the book to father and pointed out the offending word father became terribly angry then his fears were well founded i must be reading about christ he caught up the book and flung it out of the window and when i looked out and saw the covers torn off and the pages lying scattered in the yard i turned into a perfect fury as on one or two other occasions in my life i wept aloud that i had a right to know to learn to understand i wept bitterly that i was horribly ignorant that i had been put into the world but had been denied a chance to learn father and mother stood staring at me wild talk they said surely and no one was more surprised at it than i myself i could not have told when these thoughts first began whom i was blaming who was to blame after this there were long periods when father and i did not talk to each other but little by little as the weeks were passing i was again becoming quieter and more submissive again my health was breaking down and at the end of two months i was almost in the same condition as before i left for the hospital and i was again falling into despondency and indifference about this time the doctor from the hospital surprised us with a visit and when he saw that i was again run down he told me to come to the hospital and rest come whenever you feel ill he said and so before long i was back once more during the weeks when i had again grown so pale father was gentler and kinder to me he was not home when i was starting off but mother and the children stood at the window and watched me go mother's face was so full of sorrow and i too wept but this time i was glad to go from home chapter fifty four the winter was divided between the hospital and the shop when i was well i worked when i felt sick i went to the hospital and here was my chance i was hearing good english i was reading and with the trait of my race for adaptability i was quickly learning the ways of this country but at home and in the shop life became harder and harder once or twice i tried other work i tried domestic service again i went to take care of a baby and a house but my mistress found it more profitable to put me to sell newspapers at the newsstand which she kept it was near a saloon in a wretched neighbourhood and i soon left it the second place was good but here i had to light the fire on the sabbath now i was no longer pious i observed very few of the rites but there were some of the laws that i could not break to obey them seemed bred in the bone while i was in the hospital of course i ate the meat that was there but i was conscious all the time that i was eating traif meat and to touch fire on the sabbath i could not bear then too besides when i was leaving for this place of service mother begged me not to break the sabbath in her own words i would rather walk barefooted than that you should earn money while breaking the sabbath so i left this place too then i went to work for a tailor who was a member of father's society he told us he was working in a suit establishment on fifth avenue and thirty-eighth street the suits were valued from fifty dollars up and he needed a girl to help him with the lighter work pinking ruffles felling lining and so on here i went gladly i thought it is uptown and they are working on silks i pictured an ideal shop but i soon found that it was the same thing i saw finely fitted up offices beautiful sales rooms and fitting rooms but we the tailors were huddled together into the dark basement the men joked that we were pressed together like herring in a barrel the tailor who sat next to me once said that he was surprised at his own decency he wondered that he was not a worse animal than he was i soon left the shop in disgust one day when i was leaving the hospital after a lengthy stay there the doctor's friend said this will not do i can't imagine what those places are like where you work that you get run down so quickly she looked thoughtful for a few minutes then she added i am going to find you work myself she said this as though now she was going to settle the thing once and for all she took me into her carriage and we started i could not help smiling at this unusual and pleasant way of looking for a job on the way she explained to me that she would take me to the establishment where she was having her suits made she was a good customer and mr s would surely find work for me among his tailors the carriage stopped before a fine brownstone building but when i looked out my heart sank this was the place of fifth avenue where i had worked it did not even occur to me to tell her about this shop 
what was the use and what could i say to her what one heard in a shop i felt was not to be talked about to anybody especially to one who knew nothing about shops she left me in the carriage and went in to inquire while i sat and prayed that there might be no work for me when she returned she said that there would be work for me in a few days but i never went to this place for little by little i became indifferent to work altogether at least to the kind of work that was within my reach what with the long periods of idleness after each job the months of inactivity in the hospital the natural apathy due to the illness the miserable conditions in the shops i lost all taste for work i lost my pride of independence i lost my spirit chapter fifty five in the spring a year from the time when i first went to the hospital my health was poorer than ever and my friends there began to look upon me as a problem and finally to send me to various institutions for recuperation the illness had procured me that freedom from home from which i had longed but though i was so free now less than ever my destiny seemed in my own hands the illness and my friends seemed to steer it and i did meekly whatever i was told i asked no questions i offered no resistance at first as to the hospital i carried a change of clothing wherever i went but i soon realized that i did not need it we were provided in some of the institutions we wore blue in some gray in others checks or stripes in some of the places my companions were old in some young in others mixed and when i put on my wrapper i felt that i became a part of the rest of the dependents a part of the house a part of all that i saw about me this troubled me but little by little i became used to it chapter fifty six when the warm weather came i was to go to a place in the country called white birch farm i was in the hospital when the doctor's friend told me about it and also that she was sending out another girl irene who was not strong and that i must be friends with her and take care of her then one day just as i was leaving the hospital i was called to the office to see the doctor he said in his cheerful kind manner you are going to the country and i think this will take you to grand central and he pressed a half dollar into my hand after this i neither saw nor heard and scarcely knew how i left the building when i was outside i stood still in my hand was the half dollar the first direct gift of charity to myself my face burned i can refuse it i thought i can take it right back but then i must refuse everything else the help the going away and going away had become a necessity i could no longer stand the mournful looks at home and i was by now used to having a bed all to myself when i reached home and told them that i was going away mother cried bitterly what would be the end of all this going away of staying away from my own people what would it lead to the next day at grand central i was met by a lady with her was irene and when we took our seats in the train i realized that i was going further away from home than i had yet been End of chapter fifty six chapter fifty seven of out of the shadow by rose gollop cohen this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifty seven white birch farm there were no animals except a white bulldog and none of the ground was tilled turned out to be a summer house run for needy city children sent in badges of about sixteen every two weeks the house belonged to a doctor who i heard was a very kind man he bought the place for the purpose and he was supplying all the money to run it the house which was white large and had green shutters stood close to the road across the road there was a barn grayed by time and weather and beyond it thirty acres of ground for the children to play on on these grounds down one hill and up another there was a small wood they called the grove and at the foot of it a brook ran there was a dam and a good stretch of the water was deep enough for swimming and diving the house was in charge of miss farley who brought us down besides her and irene and myself there were two colored women as help the children had not yet begun to come the house was being prepared for them i was helping but had a good deal of time to myself and i walked about outside i did not go far from the house i felt troubled there was the great quiet the fields lay so still yet life seemed to be teeming and the air was filled with silent voices 
then it began to appear as though the things were coming out of a dream it was all so strange yet familiar in about three days i went further from the house and walked among the trees i walked in among some low bushes the leaves touched my face and i stood still the quiet seemed to surround me and every now and then there was a twit a rustle and overhead the sky shone blue there seemed to be all this and i alone with it i felt my body quivering with strange feelings strange thoughts came into my mind in the house too it seemed as if i were living in a fairy tale there was a dining-room and a sitting-room and off the porch a little writing-room upstairs there were bedrooms irene and i shared a small one from the window in my corner i could see some fine old trees a bit of road a field and in the distance the side of a house gleaming white there was nothing of the institution about this place and i soon recovered my spirits as well as my health my face became brown and rosy the sun bleached my hair and again i began to find pleasure in whatever work i did but that was also perhaps because i loved miss farley i was often jealous of her at which she laughed scolded me and looked pleased i worked well but it seemed to me that this summer i did little more than play or else even work was play i saw here modern orderly systematic housekeeping there was time for everything room for everything money for everything that was necessary the thought did not come to me that all this was possible because there was means i only saw the facts miss farley was a trained nurse and a woman of education she could also do things that i had only seen men do or that i had not seen done at all she could paint she could calcimine dressed in a linen walking skirt and shirtwaist and a paper cap i would make for her she would work for hours at a stretch studying directions as she went along and her face was flushed with the exertion and the pleasure she could do wonders with a grocery box a few yards of cretonne and some brass-headed tacks and i would be helping her there again then was my chance in the hospital i had learned how to take care of a sick person of a sick room and here i was learning something of modern housekeeping miss varley also had excellent taste for shape design and colour and this too i was learning or else seeing things i knew what i wanted from the children i was learning their games they were from the ages of seven to twelve i was seventeen but now i too was twelve i ran races with them i played wolf and when the boys played baseball and were short of men they would magnanimously take in irene and me and i was as happy as could be when i managed to make a home run we played in the grove we swam in the brook i learned how to swim and dive i loved the spot near the brook the trees here grew close bending into an arch over the water the sun penetrated only in spots so that here it was greener and fresher than anywhere else and the air was sweet and moist and cool the water over the dam fell with a rustle and the children's voices in the grove sounded far away i loved to sit here on one of the rocks and dream on rainy days and evenings we played in the basement the walls here were rough and whitewashed there was a large fireplace and a few benches of an evening then we would hang up some lanterns make a good fire and draw up our seats some of the boys played on their harmonicas the girls sang the latest songs and i sang russian and jewish ones it was with reluctance and at a great deal of urging from miss farley that i began to sing i expected laughter and ridicule from the children and i was not wrong but miss farley made an example of the first boy who tittered by sending him out of the room after that it was quiet whenever i sang and little by little they became used to hearing me the children were descendants of many nationalities irish german italian american the jews had not yet begun to come they would only begin with me some of the children were rough like the roughest on cherry street many of the children were very poor when they sat down at the table it was evident that those who had been receiving little bread had also little manners they ate greedily as if they would make up for the time when they had not had enough soon i also learned to tell which children had never seen the country before these usually greeted the great outdoors with a whoop and a yell and a busy time began for miss farley and her two aides-de-camp irene and myself the boys began to run about wildly scurrying over fences and ignoring all boundaries climbing trees tearing down whole limbs filling their pockets with green apples filling even their stockings and trying to smuggle them up to bed to take home and the little girls would begin to pick hastily everything in sight 
not stopping to distinguish between flowers and weeds and pulling all up by the roots but after a day or two the boys began to play more quietly and the little girls would select their flowers and content themselves with few knowing that the next day they could pick again sometimes as i watched them i tried to picture our cherry street children scattered over the fields and on the following summer i did see them there and my own sister and brothers were among them miss farley treated irene and me very much like the rest of the children she counted us in among them when asked how many there were at the house and we ate with them but otherwise in the house as well as out of doors we were her companions often then while the children played in the fields we three would sit on the piazza sewing and miss farley would talk to us confidentially particularly to me for of irene and myself i was the more interested because to me it was all so new i would perhaps lead up with some remark or question on the subject that still troubled me religion and she would explain to me as simply as possible many little things of christianity of the various denominations and of the differences between them and as for her i don't think she had ever known any jews intimately before so she was as curious about me and my people and our customs as i was about hers i would explain to her as best i could our life as jews and some of the laws many of which seemed trivial on the surface but many of which had good reasons either moral or physical so we would converse nor did she make me feel that there was any difference because i was a jewess but twice the most serious question came up between us the question that so often has agitated the whole world that has often no doubt filled even the kindest gentile heart with doubt and suspicion that has made jews all over the world band together and appeal to god and men against the false accusation the question of jews needing the blood of a christian child for the passover this question was by no means unpopular at the time somewhere in europe a child had been found murdered and a jew was accused and was being tried for his life the first time this came up among many other matters she merely wanted to hear my explanation of it it was quite understood that she did not believe it i felt my face flush what could i explain i could not express myself well enough in english to myself it was quite clear all our laws tended to point against it no jew himself may kill even a fowl but must take it to the one certain man who has studied the laws in regard to it and made it his profession there would perhaps be one such man in a whole town ten miles my little grandfather used to walk to have a rooster killed that we might have meat in honour of the sabbath even if we had to go without it all the week for weeks and weeks we would be without it altogether because it was inconvenient to go and yet we would not kill even the little children knew that this law was necessary so that each individual might not become hardened to the habit of killing also because a professional hand would save the animal unnecessary suffering how could it be possible then that we needs must kill a little human child with my own knowledge and remembrance there was just this one warm afternoon in the spring when i was a child in our village our little old great-aunt from the next village came running her white close-fitting cap was all awry on her head her face was pale her lips dry and covered with dust children she cried at the door fast fast all of you large and small in a town not far away jewish blood is flowing like water a christian child has been found murdered and they say the jews have killed it for the passover and she ran on to warn one or two jewish families in the next village and my mother shut the door carefully and put the supper away for the morrow the second time this question came up between miss farley and myself was years later it was a cold evening in september the children were all in bed and miss farley and i perhaps irene too i do not recall were in the sitting-room there was a good fire in the grate and we felt friendly and congenial as we sat reading then i don't remember how it happened but miss farley picked up a large new volume bought recently i think and began to read to me a poem right from the beginning of the book which appeared to be a sort of an introduction or opening poem it told of a garden where there was sunshine and flowers and where two little boys neighbours one fair one dark were playing into the garden the windows of the two neighbours opened through one window the fair-haired mother often looked out and saw the sunshine and the flowers and heard her child laughing at the other window the dark-haired mother often stood after this i remember only my impression the fair-haired child disappeared its young blood was used as a sacrifice for the passover i have the impression of the mother's agony of the garden still in bloom of the sun shining 
but only one little child playing the dark one it was a well-written poem it would touch any heart with pity and horror when miss farley was through she sat quite still keeping her eyes on the page her face was flushed after a moment she said without lifting her eyes and her voice was quiet and strange with controlled emotion this might have been a custom you know perhaps it is not a custom of all jews the children would not be apt to know about it i was dumb with horror and was silent what could i say after all the years of her knowing me so intimately what could i say that night miss farley and irene and the two coloured women and all the children were together and i felt alone a stranger in the house that had been a home to me in that hour i longed for my own people whose hearts i knew but after all we were living in the nineteenth century and so in a day or two all was as usual i gave her my affection and she was glad of it and she seemed as fond of me as she was fond of irene so that first summer passed and the month of september came i thought this month the most glorious of the whole summer with its golden rods and the trees and the little creepers along the stone walls turning scarlet the brisk walks on crisp days the daily dip in the brook the sting of the cold water and then the feeling of sweet cleanliness and indoors in the evening there were the open fires the harmonica music the dances the songs and when the children were gone to bed the pleasant chat with miss farley in the pleasant warmth of the room scented with the odour of sweet fern drying on the hearth then a chilly day came the last batch of the children were with us miss farley began to pack away little bundles for the winter and from home a letter came asking me whether i knew that the day of atonement was approaching yes i knew then for a day or two again new life like the breath of midsummer swept through the house word came that the doctor who had just arrived from europe was coming to spend a day or two with us so i was to see the man who so generously had been supplying this family of twenty people for three months for a day we cleaned and polished and then we were ready to receive him he drove up from new haven late one afternoon and i saw from where we had gathered near the road to meet him a mature well-built handsome man such as i had learned by now to associate with the professional type like the doctors in the hospital he sat still for a moment with the reins in his hand as if he were tired and the picture of us suited him and he wished to hold it for a moment he smiled at the whole group of us his face was all kindness and gentleness and in his eyes there was a look of childlike inquiry which a little later i understood was due to imperfect hearing his gentleness showed itself in his every act the way he handed the reins to a boy who came to take the horse in his greeting of miss farley and irene in the courtesy he showed the little ones who after staring at him for a minute began to sidle up to him shyly matilda the cook came to take the ice cream he had brought which stood in the tub packed with salt and ice and was very heavy and he hastened to help her when a little later i came into the kitchen for something matilda said to me ruth does you know a gentleman when you sees one i was puzzled for a moment then i understood the doctor had helped her as he would have any other woman regardless of her colour he stayed with us two days during the day he came walking with us and in the evening when we hung up our lanterns in the basement and laid a good fire he sat on the bench among the children and attended with the greatest interest to our performances and we all distinguished ourselves the little italian boy who performed acrobatic stunts was more like an eel than ever and the boy who played on the harmonica and who his admirer assured us was so musical that he could play on the piano alike with his hands or toes this time performed on the harmonica with his nose irene led the virginia reel and miss farley made me sing my songs the doctor applauded and laughed heartily and miss farley who often had to suppress the boy's shouting and stamping whispered aside with a smile that the doctor made more noise than any of the children when he was going away he thanked the children he said with his kind smile that he had had a very nice time he said it as if he were the guest and we were his hosts and when i went home i knew that the next summer i would come again End of chapter fifty seven part five chapters fifty eight and fifty nine of out of the shadow by rose gollop cohen this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifty eight it was hard to get used to the old life again when i came home 
it was all stranger than ever the home my people their ways the children's faces looked lean and a little pale in spite of the sunburn from running about in the streets our couch now stood supported by a grocery box the kitchen looked like nothing more than a black hole the meals were chance and meagre oatmeal gruel for dinner i had good teeth and digestion and i craved substantial food meat and potatoes i craved variety once when i had first met miss wald and was feeling downcast as i was leaving the settlement to go home she urged me to tell her the cause but i did not know what to tell her how to put our dull existence into words she was thoughtful for a moment then she gave me some money and said with great earnestness will you do something for me will you go and buy a good good supper you all i had wondered then what a meal had to do with one's outlook on life i knew better now in the shop where i found work soon i felt more and more disgusted with conditions i found the life almost impossible my sister and i were working together in a large new loft half of it was occupied by cloaks and the other half by a contractor of skirts and capes sister and i were working on the skirts and capes there were seven of us at the finisher's little table besides sister and myself two other girls and three men the room was not bad to work in for there was plenty of light and though the table was small those of us who did not mind stretching out for the scissors and thread could sit a little distance away and so have more space but it was in other ways that life was made impossible there was one man in the shop the designer and sample maker of the cloaks to whom the other men looked up he wore a white collar and a coat at work and thought himself clever and witty whenever he was not busy he would come and amuse himself by telling obscene stories and jokes he did not like me for when i had first come i had managed to gather courage to ask the boss whether we girls could not sit at a separate table the news of this unusual request soon spread and i began to be looked upon as one who put on airs the tailors were not good enough for her to sit with one asked me do you expect to make the world over so it was quite understood that here was a girl who must be downed and the designer soon learning what i was most sensitive about sought to do it with his jokes and stories and whenever i saw him coming the blood in my temples would begin to beat like a hammer one friday he came placed himself where he could see my face and began in his leisurely way sure of being listened to i was at a wedding last night there was a burst of laughter the men foresaw what was coming and he encouraged by the effect he was making continued after a moment of significant silence he talked as he had never talked before he talked of the most intimate relations of married people in a way that made even the men exclaim and curse him while they laughed we girls as usual sat with our heads hanging and i was aware that sister's face almost touched the work in her lap his eyes were on my face and they were hurting me i was thinking that i could not even hide by merely pretending not to hear as the others did suddenly a feeling of rage shook me why did he pretend did pretending cleanse our minds from the filth thrown into them then i felt that if i could only stand up if i could only stop pretending at this moment i could never quite be a part of the filth i had absorbed the blood beat so in my head that i was half blinded at the thought of showing myself so openly then i rose and scarcely knowing what i did i flung the cape from me its purple silk lining caught on a nail in the wall opposite and hung there and i cried to them half sobbing you have made life bitter for me i pray god that rather than that i should have to go into a tailor shop again i may meet my death on my way home all this seemed to have taken a long long time and i gradually realized that it was very still in our corner of the shop and that now it was the men who sat with their heads hung and sister was standing close to me i took my coat gave her her little shawl and we went out in the half-dark hall her face as she turned it up to me was pale and her lips trembled you go home she said but i am not going it is not as hard for me because the men think i am too young to understand and i could not make her go with me she would not lose the half day she would not lose the place and she went back into the shop and i went down into the street i walked away from the building and turned and looked at it i was leaving the shop all sweatshops when the idea had come to me i could not have told but the thought of going to look for another job in another sweatshop was somehow out of the question i sauntered along through the street what now housework was the only thing left to me 
i shrank from it my experience had shown me what life might mean as a servant a drudge in someone's dark kitchen sleeping on chairs eating at a wash-tub since the Korloffs, i had learned that eating at the wash-tub was the general rule being looked down upon as an inferior for whom anything was good enough a year or two of this and i would be coarser and cruder the life would grow upon me i would lose all sensitiveness i would cease to care suddenly i wondered why i should not go and talk to miss wald about the shop i had confessed to her about so many other difficulties our own and those of our neighbours and she had always helped us out perhaps she could help here too we had come to feel that there was nothing she could not do but the next moment i thought with shame of letting miss wald know to what i had been listening in the shop of letting her find out what my mind had been fed on but my little sister is sitting there and listening and i am ashamed to talk to miss wald another woman during the next night and day i fought it out with myself beside the sense of shame there was the obstacle of not being able to express myself well enough in english it was so easy to be misunderstood and misconstrued people busy people listened to your stuttering and blundering and finally brushed you aside and this would be particularly hard to tell however i was sure of one thing that miss wald would listen to me patiently and try to get to the bottom of what i was saying but would she think it possible would she believe me or perhaps this thing that appears so horrible to me is not so horrible after all sunday morning at ten o'clock i started for the settlement miss wald was not yet down she had worked hard the day before and had been up late would i go up to her room i found her mother with her and another woman miss wald moved a chair for me near to her couch and introduced me at the sight of the strangers my mind became altogether confused and i heard their voices as though in a dream i heard her mother ask is miss blank french miss wald laughed why because she is blonde so the french are dark i thought my mind fastened on this as though it were very important and i kept thinking so the french are dark then i thought that the strangers must be wondering why i was there the thought also came that i could still go without saying anything about the shop but suddenly i leaned over and whispered to miss wald that i must see her alone she glanced at me quickly laid her hand on mine in my lap and pressed it affectionately as she talked to her visitors at last they were gone they seemed to have gone quite suddenly what happened after that i could never remember except a look of horror in miss wald's face and the words why ruth they always told me they assured me that oh that place is not fit to work in chapter fifty nine monday morning at eight o'clock i went to the nurse's settlement as the outcome of my confession to miss wald i was to learn how to make shirt waists in their little shop and now i was to know miss anne o'there the woman who made a great difference in my life the shop was on the top floor in the east broadway house to get to it one had to pass a gaslit ante-room i climbed the stairs and stopped before this room my heart beat violently i was entering on a new life what was there for me now as i opened the door i was surprised then delighted before a large table a woman stood cutting i had already met her and she had made a deep impression on me and now when i saw her i knew at once that she was my boss a short time before this she had come to cut out gym suits for the gym class to which i belonged and show us girls how to make them she had noticed me because i could baste faster than any other girl so i basted still faster and observed her i saw that her ways were so gentle and quiet and she bent over each girl as if she had known her a long time the suits were made in two or three friday nights and the last night she came downstairs with a group of us girls and as she was bidding us good-night i watched her with regret then i saw her glance at me and i was sure she would come and talk to me she did where do you live she asked when i told her she slipped her arm through mine and walked with me a little ways i had made up my mind that she belonged to a family that were rich and accomplished how then could she be so splendid she learned how to sew perhaps that she might be able to teach girls then i learned from someone in the settlement that she was a working woman of working people and a champion of labour this morning she greeted me in her quiet gentle way then she opened the door and we went into a little room where three girls were bending over sewing machines this is miss she said and i was amazed 
this was like coming to a sociable and not a shop in which to work she gave me a seat and showed me how to make buttonholes in a scrap of blue gingham many times that day she came to look at my buttonholes her long slim hands touched mine tenderly her eyes were saying kind things i could scarcely believe that i was not dreaming nevertheless i felt discouraged for years i had been working for money and now i was sewing on rags the little shop turned out to be more and more like a shop in a dream i was reading at the time a book translated from the russian called what is to be done or the vital question by chernyshevsky in this book there was an ideal sewing shop and i felt as if our little shop too was out of a story we all sat in a group in the centre of the little attic room where the best light fell on my right there was a shelf with some materials on the left was a door and behind it a little gas stove which we used at lunch-time the older of the three girls we consulted in regard to the work when miss o'there was not in then there was margaret who was fifteen she was tall and slim and pretty and her grey eyes were bright with fun and laughter she had never yet worked anywhere fan was a jewish american girl of sixteen she had come from the sweatshop her life at home was hard and she worked as if she had never had time to learn anything right she read greedily even in the street as she walked to and from work and she knew how to drive a bargain her people were in dire poverty perhaps it was this that taught her the art at any rate it would take a clever pushcart peddler to get the best of fan after a few days a machine came for me and i was taught how to make shirtwaists and now while i was learning how to make a shirtwaist i was also learning something of the meaning of things or many things that had seemed without meaning miss o'there took my measure and said i was to be her shirtwaist model the fitting room was a few steps below where everything was covered with blue denim and we called it the little blue room and in this room with her mouth full of pins and while pinning me into a shirtwaist she would talk to me with a few words at a time she slowly opened my mind to one thing after another and i when i found that i could ask questions that it was neither improper nor would i be thought a fool became as greedy as little fan in her reading there were so many things that i wanted to know i wanted to know about our race about myself about the irish on cherry street about the shop the questions went tumbling all over each other in my mind and in my speech but she interpreted each one i did not need to worry about my english she looked at me and she seemed to understand me better than i understood myself and i too soon learned to understand her i became sensitive to her every motion and expression it appeared that there was a reason for everything things were not thrown into the world in a haphazard way she told me something of the history of the irish people of their joys of their sorrows of their humour of their bitter struggle to free themselves and gradually i lost my fear of the irish on cherry street she explained my own race to me she explained the shop what a revelation the men's conduct in the shop could be explained just look she would say what are their lives you know sweating from early to late some haven't even their families here talking it is perhaps the only joy within their reach i suppose it is a kind of joy and when you work like an animal you live like an animal so i began to see tailors in a different light the new world she opened to me did not make me sad on the contrary it had been far more sad to see things happen and not to understand all this time the life of all of us together in the shop was continuing as in a dream it was like a dream to be working only from eight o'clock until five with an hour for lunch for lunch one of us three young girls would get off a little earlier and make cocoa for all we each paid ten cents a week toward it and two cents a day to fan for the fruit which she bought and it was like a dream to sit down to a prettily set table with blue dishes and bright silver which miss wald placed for our use i did not at once fit in with this new life i would sit a little distance away from the table and brood i longed to be with them but something seemed to hold me back at five o'clock when we stopped work one of us three younger girls had to sweep up when my turn came i told her with tears that i did not want to sweep sweeping was housework and housework outside of your own home was degrading you were looked down upon you were a servant and so she would talk to me and would reason with me as my mother had done when i was a child no work was high or low she would explain to me all work is honourable if honestly done then i developed a feeling of deep jealousy 
i could not bear the thought that all the other girls were as much to her as i was having found her i wanted to keep her all to myself but soon she drew me into the group on saturday fan and i did not work at all because it was our sabbath now i would have been willing to work for my religious scruples were gone but my parents would on no condition consent to it so i was off both days and fan too but the rest worked the half day and after it on many mild afternoons we all went to the park always it was wonderful to me to hear miss o'there explain things there was always something new in the way she saw them always there was a touch of seriousness under everything she treated us all as if we were her little sisters and taught and guided us we led a sweet life we received very little money a dollar a dollar and a half two dollars a week at this i wondered for i did not know what this little shop meant that it was established to teach me and the others a trade and that what little money we did receive was merely meant to encourage us or help our families i did not know perhaps it would have been better if i had known i might have tried harder for its success having been trained to work under the lash of a whip it is a question whether i was fit to be left entirely to my honour what was true of me was i think true of the other girls too at any rate one day when i had worked at the shop about a year miss wald and miss o'there were locked up all afternoon in the little blue fitting-room at five o'clock we learned that the shop could not pay for itself we all wept at the news and soon we were scattered all over the city placed at work for which we were best fitted or wherever there happened to be an opening i had kept with some neatness the materials on the shelf in our little shop so i was placed as a stock-keeper in a fifth avenue dressmaking establishment i had great difficulty to keep my job with the few words of english i knew how to read and write but the work fascinated me because i had to use a pencil instead of a needle using a pencil meant education so i begged madame to be patient with me here i learned some new words and a little spelling while labelling the stock we worked regular hours but often the girls had to stay overtime for which they received twenty-five cents supper money we worked from eight until seven we entered the brownstone building through the basement felt about in a pitch-dark closet where we hung our clothes and stood about in the dark hall adjoining the kitchen and peeped in curiously at madame's coloured domestic help hustling about until we heard the bell upstairs tinkle for us the dressmakers were three sisters the oldest was a large woman with grey hair stern face and an uneasy self-conscious look in her eyes she had charge of the waist lining she kept her girls about her in a group and her face never relaxed for a moment to any of them the youngest had charge of the waist she was small and pretty and i never heard her speak harshly to a girl the middle sister was madame k she was good-looking and she had a tall slender pretty form when she came into the room all the heads bent lower over their work it was then that the uneasy self-conscious look came into the grey sister's eyes yet i did not think madame k unkind she was the only one who it seemed to me understood how really difficult for me was the work i was doing while she was often impatient and spoke harshly she was also sometimes kind after i had worked a couple of weeks i asked her whether i was doing any better i was anxious that she should not be the loser by having kept me why yes she said in her brisk manner then she looked at me and her busy fingers which were draping a piece of silk stopped for a moment madame k rarely took time to look at any one why she said you are a queer little thing she said it as if she were seeing me for the first time her admitting that i was doing better meant much to me it helped me keep the job as long as i did for i had to put up with hardship and a great deal of humiliation i missed the congenial spirit of our little settlement shop all for one and one for all here it was more as in the sweatshop each one for himself i had not made friends with any of the girls all but one of them were americans when i made blunders they could only stare at me and i thought them proud and unkind this one girl was irish and when i had learned to understand her and her brogue i liked her she worked on the skirts and she often came into the stock-room to baste on a large table that stood there she kept her book of measurements open before her i glanced at it curiously one day do you know how to write these she caught me up not these things i pointed to the fractions well you better learn she said one of these days madame will call you into the fitting-room to write the measurements and if you don't know how 
that day i spent the half-hour lunch period writing fractions it was in this way that i liked best to learn because i could see the use for the thing i was learning of the greatest interest to me here perhaps were the garments from these i tried to get an idea of the wealth in the world and the lives of the wealthy people as light and as flimsy as some of these garments were their expensiveness was evident and suggested to my imagination heaps of gold coins everything seemed an occasion for the wealthy and there was a garment for each occasion a dinner gown a tea gown a morning gown an afternoon gown an evening gown an opera gown a ball gown a street gown some of the customers fitted two and three at a time when did they wear them all what else did they do beside attending balls and dinners at fitting time it was my part to take the garment from the girls and carry it into the fitting-room to madame k so i soon began to know many of the customers by sight their looks and bearing did not suggest simple homes i pictured mansions and hosts of servants my reading helped me in the picture-making the stock-room was a little dark room that served also as a passage between the workroom and the fitting-rooms a heavy portiere hung at one door hiding the workroom from the fitting-room looking into these two different rooms was like looking into two different worlds in one the workroom the girls sat with their heads bent muscles tense faces dull or absorbed stitching silently here it was always silent for either one of the sisters was always there or both the faces and the clothes of the girls suggested their life the life that i knew in the other room through the portiere many hours of the day one woman or another would be standing before the long mirrors gazing at herself beside her madame k kneeled with the long train of her black silk dress spread behind her on the green carpet here there was always a light babbling which i could not help overhearing there were often little bursts of confidences i know i looked well last night because the women were asking me whether i was not growing fat usually it was on clothes yes i like my hat and it was a bargain this time it was only sixty-four dollars sixty-four dollars father would have to work six weeks for sixty dollars i received four dollars a week it came quite natural to figure it so but i felt no envy and no resentment i worked here until christmas or rather over christmas christmas eve two of the girls had to stay overtime to finish a gown that night i sat in the little darkened stock-room and waited to pack it downstairs i knew the coloured man was waiting to deliver it from where i sat i could see the whole workroom dark except for the one corner where the two girls sat bending over the white satin gown between them one of the girls was weeping i had often thought her proud but now she did not look a bit proud she looked so human and lovable tears were running down her little straight nose whenever the tears came she would turn away a little that they might not fall on the small pink roses she was stitching on to the hem she reminded me of the many times i had been felling sleeve lining until late at night after the other workers were gone End of chapter fifty nine chapter sixty and sixty one of out of the shadow by rose gollop cohen this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 60 And now I went to the factory to make use of the trade I learned in the settlement shop. Miss O'There found me a place. I learned that to find a job it was not necessary to go from factory to factory. Instead, you read the advertisements in the newspapers. And, strange enough, the printed names and addresses turned out to be of real people. Miss O'There, who came with me, inquired for me yes shirt-waist makers were wanted and i was taken on i followed a forewoman through long aisles of sewing machines till she placed me at a machine in the middle of the loft and showed me how to work the treadle it was run by steam power i pressed my foot there was a terrific noise and i did not hear the forewoman go then something made me turn my head and i looked up and found her standing at my machine so it was all day she brought me a bundle of work and told me to make up a sample waist i worked very carefully i measured the centerpiece with the tape measure i brought i made dainty french seams and stitched with a small round stitch i felt confident in our little settlement shop i had worked on silks french flannels and fine chambray this was ordinary material shortly before noon i finished the waist i was not mistaken the forewoman looked pleased as she examined it 
she turned to me this is beautiful she said but my dear girl working like this you won't earn your salt do you know what these waists pay i shook my head a dollar and a quarter a dozen i was dumb with surprise she looked at me a moment what you need she said is speed i'll show you how to work i rose and she sat down at the machine she lengthened the stitch to three times the size her back bent over her eyes fastened on the machine her hands flew and the machine whirred she seemed to become one with it i remembered this picture later it was the typical picture of a sewing machine operator i worked a few days then i was sent away i was not worth the machine and space i occupied in my place they could have a woman turning out a dozen and a half waist a day so now i went from factory to factory trying to acquire speed i worked a day here a few days there till they found me out it is hard to become a botcher as a good worker and i was often discouraged and despondent the thought what is it all about what is it for came rather often to turn out a good piece of work had been a satisfaction its place now was taken by how many more wastes can i do to-day than yesterday but how long can this kind of thing satisfy one at last i came to the immense shirt-waist factory of f brothers here i had applied as a tucker in the hope that by specializing i would do better the forewoman soon noticed no doubt that i was not a tucker and needing a hand on one of her special machines she asked me if i would like to try it and told me its merits a hand who could earn a good day's wages would have hesitated to accept but what had i to lose i had not yet earned three dollars a week as a shirt-waist maker if i had not had my people and my home where would i have been now and besides i was always eager for new experiences it turned out to be an eight-needle tucking machine i was at once delighted and fascinated by it a machine that could make eight tucks in almost the time that it took to make one the strain on my eyes was terrific i had to watch eight needles instead of one but then i told myself i would earn several times more than i would have otherwise what a wonderful inventor what a wonderful machine i soon learned however that i was paid no more than if i were making one tuck but the machine continued to interest me and i was doing here better than i had yet done so when there was an opening i brought my sister and settled myself down to stay sister was put to make shirtwaist at the extreme end of the block long loft and i and a group of several other eight and five needle tuckers stood in the middle of it and now all day long i sat feeding white lawn and eight pin tucks came out all day hundreds of yards of lawn slipped over my table and fell into a large basket at first i dared not lift my eyes from the needles in the evening my eyes smarted and my back ached but when i learned to understand my machine i did not have to watch so closely i could tell by the sound it made when a needle grew dull when a thread broke when a stitch slipped every different trouble made its own different sound and as i watched my machine from day to day it seemed to me like a human being when i did not take care of it oil it clean it it did not work properly i began to love my machine and in my mind i called it my partner because it helped me to earn my six dollars we were peace workers some of the girls who could work without lifting their eyes earned more than six dollars that was how my sister worked but i could not do that indeed i did not want to i did not want to become like my machine so while i fed at the lawn i listened and looked about a little and thought over what i saw from where i sat i could see the whole floor from end to end i saw hundreds and hundreds of girls bending over sewing machines the floor vibrated beat steadily like a pulse with the steam power the air was filled with the whir i had to keep my head low to distinguish the noise of my own machine and we girls shouted and watched each other's lips when we talked but we did not talk much right in front of me at a big table stood a large stout woman with a red handsome face she was the head forewoman all day long she stood or sat at the table drafting patterns drinking beer with her head bent under the table and watching us there were also assistant forewomen and foremen and assistant foremen and superintendents and assistant superintendents they were all watching us the bosses we only saw once a day passed through the aisles one was round-shouldered with a little black beard and a cross eye he walked through quickly with his head bent and a preoccupied look on his face 
the other boss was straight and tall and he wore a grey french beard he walked leisurely with his head in the air and looked about one day we heard that one of our bosses had gone to europe when after some months he returned to the factory there was a celebration the steam power was turned off and the assistant forewomen announced that downstairs in the salesrooms there was cake and wine and music but few besides the forewomen went down we remained sitting at our machines talking to each other our own voices sounded strange to us in the quiet and we felt self-conscious soon the forewomen returned and each one of us received a sealed little envelope with her number on it we were all called here by the numbers of our machines my machine and i were ninety-three in the little envelope each one of us three hundred employees found a little trinket in roman gold when the head forewoman returned her face was redder than usual and beaming with joy she had received a curiously made ivory cross she called us to her table and showed it to us she raised her hand for attention and we all pressed to the table she cried it is no wonder they are so prosperous they are so good to us god is blessing them some of the girls looked at her in bewilderment and listened doubtfully the year before two weeks after the gifts had been received the prices had been cut a quarter of a cent on a yard of hem stitching five cents on a hundred yards of tucking twenty-five cents on a dozen waists chapter sixty one i was eighteen when i met l v i had come home from work had supper and sat on the stoop looking into the street when suddenly a small dog jumped into my lap i stood up so quickly that he fell like a bundle at my feet then i saw that he was on a chain and tugging at the end of it was a small dark young man he slapped the little dog i am so sorry he said i saw that his eyes were not serious i said i was all right i brushed my skirt and sat down again and he raised his hat and led the little dog away the little animal i knew belonged to our neighbour in the front a middle-aged childless woman who repaired wigs for her living who was the young man none of our men raised their hats like that and from the few words of english he had spoken i understood that he was not only an american but a person of education he came back in a few minutes and stopped near the stoop and i knew that he would talk to me and i sat there the dog soon made it possible he kept pulling at the chain toward me i had sometimes stopped to pat him does he know you the young man asked i said yes so we began to talk he told me that he had come from chicago to visit his aunt the next evening when i came out on the stoop he too soon came and again i let him talk to me i had never before spoken to a young man to whom i had not been introduced yet this seemed all right and i spoke to him as if i were in my own house to the house i did not ask him it was nothing unusual to receive company on the street in fact it was often the only place it was hard to entertain guests in the one room for the little dark bedroom was filled with clothing and folding cots and the extra bedding and other things and the little dark hole of a kitchen was out of the question so there was really only the one room and this was the living room of seven of us here we slept and washed and dressed and ate we had to make great preparations to receive a stranger now it was not as when we were little we felt conscious of the inevitable dirt and the dinginess and the broken-up furniture and felt ashamed so we met on the stoop l v told me he had been to many places and i was proud to tell him what i knew of life outside of cherry street i told him of the people and white birch farm he showed surprise to meet any one here who knew anything outside of the old customs our common knowledge outside of here was at once like a relationship between us and seemed to separate us a little from the rest my parents saw me talking to the young man and they smiled at each other the aunt also saw then one day i noticed that my mother was no longer smiling and she told me that l v s aunt felt it her duty to tell us about her nephew he was really not a bad young man but he got in with the christians with the missioners the aunt explained at this my heart began to beat so quickly that it pained i felt a foreboding of coming trouble soon i learned that l v was baptized and that the missionaries were training him for their own profession by now l v was coming into the house and i continued to see him as before but to my parents now there was all the difference in the world a jew who forsook his own religion his own people was worse than a gentile worse than a heathen he was an apostate he was a disgrace 
supposing the neighbours learned who the young man was that their daughter went about with an outcast for he who forsook judaism for another religion belonged nowhere he may be baptized a thousand times to the christian he is still the jew and his own people can only pray to god to have pity on him if then it should become known that their daughter associated with the meshumad apostate the whole family would be disgraced and what would her chance of marriage be and marriage was all important as a specimen of a daughter i was a disappointment first there had been the illness then disobedience and queer notions and what kind of an influence was i for the children clearly then it would be a blessing if i were married and then too i was already eighteen and it was really high time the two younger girls were coming up very fast as to myself i felt bewildered between my parents and the young man and my own feelings and ideas which seemed all tangled up i could not easily distinguish one thing from another to break friendship because his ideas happened to be different seemed narrow-minded and i did not want to be narrow-minded i also felt that my parents must allow me to judge for myself and they must trust me but they would do neither father as of old wanted me to submit to him in the old custom his opposition antagonized me now more than ever i fought against him with all my strength mother hinted that i dropped the acquaintance with l v but i ignored it father commanded and i refused of course they could do nothing they even had to smile that neighbours might not guess but what trouble there was within our four walls in the meantime i learned to know l v better and better he talked religion just as the woman missionary in the hospital had talked it sounded like a lesson learnt by heart then too there was a certain lightness about everything he said always the eyes lacked seriousness and the lips almost smiled as if life were a joke i felt dreadfully troubled one saturday he came to our house with a young man friend of his and introduced him i little thought that day to what his introduction would lead later it was late in the afternoon and our candlesticks which we placed on the table friday night still stood there we would not touch them until it grew dark and at least three stars were out only the very orthodox jews observe this custom but in our house father made us all observe it no matter what other customs were neglected elvie's friend noticed it with surprise he said he had not been to such a strictly orthodox looking house since he had come to this country ten years before i could see that he looked at us all with pity knowing elvie's ideas on religion he understood what trouble we were all in i had never seen elvie before with other people except with those of my own family he and his friend discussed politics and religion and i sat and listened and watched them they were so different l v as always spoke jestingly about everything the friend was serious yet he could jest too he was very outspoken almost blunt i liked him when they were gone mother looked at me with her pleading eyes and said now do you see the difference something within me seemed to harden in a moment and i said no i can't see any difference what would have happened i cannot tell but he soon left for chicago to prepare to go to a theological seminary out west and we began to correspond and now an unexpected joy came into my life writing and here again as with the other things that i had learned it seemed accidental it is to this correspondence that i owe a great deal of what i learned of writing in english with the help of the children i could read and write script myself now all day long then at the machine i thought over what i would say and looked forward to the evening when i could write this to me was not like writing a sentence which no one would ever see the thought that what i wrote would be read and weighed and thought about filled me with excitement so i wrote and rewrote my letters using up a great deal of paper months passed and one day i was filled with joy and pride i realized quite suddenly that i had learned to read and write well enough to do the corresponding myself in the spring l v returned to the city to start west one day he told me that he loved me and asked me to wait for him two years i thought of my parents and i could not help weeping at the suffering i must cause them but i also thought it right for me to do what i thought was right i saw my life so empty without the letters surely that was love and i promised to wait he went away and again he began to correspond how joyfully i greeted the first letter that came 
i knew and loved every line and curve of the simple clear handwriting i spent a great deal of time in copying the phrases that pleased me i gave these letters most of my time and thought i almost lived for them in his letters l v sometimes told me of boyish escapades flirtations but as long as letters came nothing mattered sometimes when i thought it over it seemed queer that it did not matter sometimes too i tried to think of myself married but i could not picture myself married to him or any one else i liked the companionship of men but the thought of marriage often filled me with fear even with disgust so the sweatshop left its mark End of chapter 61